Hello everyone and welcome to the DCC's inaugural webinar on customizing DMP online. Uh, in this session we're going to provide you with a brief demonstration of the newly released version 4 of DMP online and then we're going to go on to show you a little bit about how you can start to customize the tool with local support examples and guidance uh, relevant to your particular institution that will help the researchers in your organization to be able to respond to funding body questions uh, about research data management and sharing a little bit more easily. Uh, the way that the session is going to work, um, if you do want to ask a question, we'd ask that you go to the left hand side of the screen and you'll see a QA box and if you can type your question into that, We'll be gathering these over the course of the uh, session and we'll put them all to Sarah Jones at the end of the session. So if you can just do it that way, that would be perfect. Um, if you do have any technical problems, again, just put that into the QA session uh, section and we'll try to respond to that as best we can. And at this point, I'll hand over to my colleague Sarah Jones from the DCC and she will run you through a, a quick demo of DMP Online version 4. Okay, thank you very much, Joy. Um, so I'm going to begin, I'll just start sharing my screen, um, and I'm going to begin by showing you a quick demo of DMP Online. Um, and then I'll go through a few slides that profile some of the customization options. So you may well have already logged into the tool, but just in case you haven't, I want to give you a quick walkthrough of how the tool works. So this is um, DMP Online version 4. You can see we've got a screencast on, on the home page here. That gives you a very quick walkthrough if, if you're not familiar with the tool. And there are some basic menu items at the top here telling you about the tool. Um, there's a news feed that pulls from the DCC website. And there's some general help as well. On the help, we've got two types of help. There's some help about the tool specifically that explains to researchers how to use a different function, so how to create a plan, how to fill in their plan, and then how to share it with colleagues and export it. And there's also some general data management planning help. And this is really just links to useful resources. So details about funder requirements, both here and in the US. We've got links to things like the DCC checklist and a number of example data management plans. And we found these are particularly useful because people often want to see a worked example so they have a sense of how much to write. I'll just go back to the home page and I'll show you how the registration works. It's very simple. It's just an email and a password. We list organizations here. We have a number of UK universities listed, um, but if your organization is not in the UK or a uni, you can select other organization as well. I'll just start by signing into the tool. If you're based in the UK at a university, you can also use your institutional credentials, so you're not having to use two different logins and remember another password. So when you first log in, you come to the My Plans page. And you can see I've got a couple of plans listed here, but at the start, you're not likely to have one. So I'll walk through the process of creating a plan. And I want to focus specifically on the kind of institutional information that you can add to the tool so that that pulls through for researchers within your organization. So when researchers start to create a plan, we ask them a couple of questions to figure out what questions and guidance they should be presented with. So the first question is about whether they're applying for funding. And there's a number of templates here for the different research councils in the UK, for some bodies overseas, and, and the European Commission. So I'll pick MRC as an example. It then asks about the institution that you're based in so that you're presented with relevant questions and guidance from your university. And you can see it's already selected Glasgow because that's, that's what I'm registered for. There are other sources of guidance that researchers can select to see as well. Um, at the moment, we've just got generic guidance from the DCC here, but we would like to add more discipline-specific guidance too. So I'll go to create a plan. And you can see it just confirms the selection. And then when you come through first, there's some basic information about the plan. Um, you can enter a project name. I'll just put 
the 2007 study in as an example. Um, you can enter details, a description of the project, details about the people working on it, who the data contact is, and just update that. This front page also tells you, it gives you a, an overview of the plan, it tells you what it's based on. So here we have links to the MRC guidance and you can see the different sections within the MRC plan and the questions that the researcher is going to be presented with. And they can either use the answer questions button here or you can navigate by the tabs at the top to work through the plan. So I'll just go into the MRC plan. You can see the various sections here. And I'll just open one up to show you how that works. So here we've got a question about the methodologies for data collection. There's some guidance from the MRC that accompanies this particular question. And because I, I'm from Glasgow and I've selected to see DCC guidance too, we have some guidance pulling through by themes. So for Glasgow, we have links to the data management web pages. I'll show you what happens when you answer a question. I'll just put test in there for now. It tells you who's answered the question and it starts to update the progress bar here. Researchers can also share plans with colleagues and I'll just put a colleague at the DCC here as an example. Now what I can do, I can decide what level of sharing to give. Um, I can either make Jonathan a co-owner of the plan, which would mean he'd have the same level of permissions as me. He could share the plan with others, he could edit it, he could delete it if needed. Or I can just allow him to edit, or I can just give him read-only access. So once you add the collaborator, it will send them an email and that email will depend on whether they already have an account with the tool. So if they have an account, um, they'll get an email with the link to the plan to just go straight to it. Or if they're not known by the system, they'll be sent an invite to join DMP online and then they'll get access to the plan. I'm able to change those permissions at any time and I can remove the user access as well. The other function in here is exporting a plan. And I'm going to go back to a worked example to show you the export instead. So this is a plan for the NERC. Um, the Natural Environment Research Council has two stages of a data management plan, an outline plan and a full plan. The outline one is done at the grant application stage. And if I click into here, I get different options for export. I can export it as a web page and you can see the three questions from NERC and the answers in there. Or I can export it as plain text or as a PDF with or without admin details. And those admin details are the ones that are captured at the start here. We're adding more export formats as well. Now, because I want to talk specifically about how you can customize the tool, I want to show you another example so that you get to see an institutional template because that's something that you may want to create. So I'm going to select no funder here so that I can bring up one of the university templates. And I'll select the University of Edinburgh as an example. You can see it asks now to select a template because there are two templates at Edinburgh. And I'll just select this main one just for, for researchers in general. There are also some additional guidance options here. I have the general option for guidance from the DCC, but there's also an option for guidance from the Roslyn Institute. Um, this is an institute in the vet school and they have guidance at a lower level that's specific to that institute. So again, I'll go through to create a plan and you'll see here the summary of what's in the Edinburgh data management plan. This is based on what they say in their policy. So they mentioned these particular themes that should be addressed in plans and they've put together a few questions for each. So I'll go into um, answer the plan, answer the questions. 
and I'll show you some of the features you can add to really help researchers answer the questions. So here the question about storage, there are a number of checkboxes to give researchers some pointers on where they may want to store their data. And this example here about how the data will be backed up, they've taken an example from one of those plans that were listed on the page. Um, this is RELU, it was a rural and um, economy land use program run by BBSRC and ESRC and NERC and this is just one of the examples out of that plan so it, it gives researchers a sense of the kind of things they might want to say about backup and then you can see there's this guidance from Edinburgh about the storage and backup provided there and guidance from the Roslyn Institute too so here for example on who will be responsible for the data management plan Roslyn Institute gives a pointer about the staff that are available there so the fact that they have a dedicated quality management department because that's somebody that you might want to contact the data officer in that post. There's also a suggested answer in this template under retention and preservation. Um, a lot of researchers might want to use the data share repository so there's some text here about data share that you can literally just copy and paste in. If researchers were going to use that repository, this is some text that they might want to use to explain about that service. So that's a couple of examples. Um, the other thing I want to just show you um, is what a, a plan looks like when it's locked for editing. Um, I have an example here that was shared with me by, by Jonathan and it's read-only access that I have so I'll go in to view this plan it's an AHRC technical plan and because I don't have edit rights you'll see that I have this read-only view I can see the answer that's been put in there I can see the guidance that's available and I can export the plan um, but it's locked to editing and when researchers are collaborating individual sections will get locked for editing like this if, if a colleagues in there already working on the plan you won't be able to go in and, and update at that same point so that's a quick overview of how DMP online works I'm just going to pull up my slides now and talk specifically about the customization options so some of this will reiterate what you've seen already but I just want to highlight the different options that you have if you're wanting to customize the tool so there are a number of things you're able to do within DMP online as an organization you're able to add your own template or multiple templates if you want more than one and templates are essentially a set of questions and answers and you can split those up into different sections as needed you can also add questions to other templates so if you want to add things in addition to what funders are asking for example you can add questions to that and then I think what's really important is adding custom guidance because researchers won't always be aware of the support and services that are available at your organization so you're able to add custom guidance you're able to add drop-down options examples and suggested answers and one of the things we're working on at the moment is adding options to brand the tool so you're able to add logos and details to make it look and feel like an institutional service so I have some screen grabs just to profile some of these examples this first one here is a template put in by the University of East London you can see it has two phases they have a light version of their plan and then a full data management plan and they have various sections you can see and um, you'll have noticed this on the demo already you can ask your question the researchers will get a box to answer and you can have guidance that accompanies each question you can also provide examples and suggested answers um, examples will be relevant for every question it's, it's useful to give people a sense of, of the kinds of things they could say in an answer suggested answers um, won't come up as, as regularly because it's hard to predict what can be said um, and give people text that they can copy and paste but where you have a service in place like a repository 
you will be able to provide some text about that so that if researchers are going to use that service, they can just use the, the text that you propose. I mentioned about things like drop-down options as well. Um, these are just some, some examples of that. So you can either have your drop-downs in a list or you can have a number of checkboxes. This one comes from the NERC template. They ask what data repository the researchers will be depositing in. So you get the options there. And there's always a box below for comments if people want to leave a, a more detailed response. You can also propose a, a style for the response. So here, NERC asks that a table is filled in. And you're able to put that table in the answer box ready so that researchers follow the suggested format that you'd like to see. I mentioned that universities can have more than one template. If you want to provide templates for different audiences, so for research staff and for postgraduates, you can have different templates. And the templates can also have multiple phases. And this is really to encourage researchers to actively update the data management plan throughout the course of the project. You may want to ask different questions in those early stages when you know the plans are still very preliminary as opposed to the questions you'd ask when the research is well underway. This is an example from Horizon 2020. They ask for a plan within the first six months of the project and then they want that plan updated at least at the midterm and the final review. You can also add questions to other people's templates, um, particularly funder templates. So there may be things that funders don't ask that you want to know as the organization that the research is being conducted in. So I've got a couple of examples here. You may want to know about the volume of data that's being created and to get a specific um, quantity so that you can see whether that exceeds the storage capacity that researchers have um, just as, as the norm so that you can make sure anything in excess is costed in. You may want to know about things like any training requirements because there may be an onus on the institution to provide relevant support so that would help with, with planning the provision. Or you may want to make an offer to researchers. You may want to say, you know, we can help you with your data management plan and provide feedback or give you details about the support that's available. So, you know, you could ask a question about whether they would like to be contacted. Um, what we've been asked to do is to build in some flags and triggers so that if you do ask questions like this, then the, the tool will alert you and, and prompt you to give a response or to get in touch with the researcher. So that's um, a little bit about the questions that you can ask. And I want to move on now and talk specifically about the guidance within the tool. You'll have seen on the demo that guidance comes in from various sources. Um, you can have guidance that pertains to a specific question. And that normally comes either from the person who's created the template and written guidance to accompany their questions. Or as an organization, you could write guidance that attaches two specific questions within various other templates within the tool. Um, that's going to be more, a more complicated process for you to follow, but in some cases it is actually needed because the guidance that you have only pertains to a particular question. But we've also drawn out a number of themes that are used across the various different data management plans so that it's an easier process for you to think, well, this is what we provide in terms of storage and backup, or this is what we suggest in terms of ethics. And then whenever a question comes up addressing storage or ethics, your guidance is applied. So you can write guidance by a number of themes, and I'll, I'll show the themes on the next slide. And then whenever those themes come up across the different templates, your guidance will be pulled in. And you may, may have noticed the DCC guidance is attached to themes as well, so the overlays onto the various different templates. And you can have guidance at different levels by theme, either by, by discipline or for a particular institute. So these are the themes we're using within DMP Online. 
there is some about the data that will be created, whether there's existing data that can be used, third-party data, and then a, a kind of description of the data, what format or type it will be in. There are some themes about the data capture, so what standards, what documentation will be used. Things like ethics and IPR, you will find come up in a number of, of the different data management plan templates and storage, obviously, that comes up across the board. There are also a number of themes around data sharing, so what the expected reuse is, the methods for sharing, when the data will be shared, and what kind of restrictions might be in place. Themes around the preservation plans, where the data will be deposited, and then the responsibilities and resourcing for carrying out the plan. These are the themes that we found came up across the board. Some, some come up in just one or two templates, and, and some of these themes come up in pretty much every template. So this, this shows you some examples of guidance from the University of Glasgow. The guidance can be added by theme to apply across the board, or it can be written for specific questions. And this first piece of guidance on storage and backup is attached to the theme. So whenever that theme comes up, we pull in this guidance because it is quite generic. It applies irrespective of discipline. It's just telling researchers that you know they should use the university servers. It gives them the pointers for local IT contacts and for the help desk here. In the MRC template, there's a question about related policies at the institution. And they give a table to fill in, which we filled in at Glasgow. We've put the links to all the various policies here. So we have that worked example. And that's particularly relevant to that question. So we have some specific guidance that just pertains to that question in the MRC template to pull in that worked example for people to reuse. So that's the different levels of guidance that you can present. As you'll have seen in the demo, you can also have guidance at a lower level. Um, at the University of Edinburgh, they have guidance for the whole institution. And they're also thinking about guidance at a kind of unit, at a school level. Um, and the first example we've got of that is the Roslyn Institute, because they have their own data managers and, and they have quite set procedures to follow within Roslyn. One of the other features that's coming soon is the branding. We want to be able to allow you to add logos to the tool. We also realize that you'll probably want some high level information that's, that's always visible. So information about any um, help desks that you have that researchers should be contacting, links to things like your guidance web pages on data management, or details of your policy, because they're relevant links that people may want to consult as they're writing their whole plan. We've also been asked about custom URLs. So having the address is DMP online at your domain rather than .dcc.ac.uk. And also custom style sheets. So you can have your own look and feel, the, the university colors and branding. And there are a number of other features in development too. We are going to introduce a comment feature. This has been requested by researchers, so they're able to discuss the responses as they're collaborating. The tool is already capturing um, a log of all the different answers, so a kind of version history of all the answers. And we want to expose that with the comment feature so that people can actually see what the earlier responses were and, if needed, revert back. There's been some work done on SWORD deposit for version 3 of DMP Online, and we're going to pull this through to version 4 so that you can um, pull out and, and easily deposit DMPs. And we're also doing some work on an API so that we can integrate the tool more easily with other systems. There are more export formats coming, um, and what we're working on currently is, is the admin pages, and that will allow you to customize the tool yourself. So I just want to very briefly show you a screen grab of the admin interface. 
it looks very much like the tool. Um, it's just blue so that you can differentiate it from the live side. You can see here this is um, the admin for Glasgow. At Glasgow we have custom guidance but we don't have our own template so there's no template listed here but if we wanted to create one we'd just follow this button and then enter the relevant sections and questions. You can see the other templates listed here. You can view those, you can customize them to add your own information to it. And there's options for guidance um, to add that. You can see the organization details so that you can upload your logo and, and your other details. <clears throat> and you can also see the users who have signed on at your organization. So you can get a sense of the usage and how you can support that. We are going to be releasing this very soon. So if you're wanting to do a customization of DMP Online, it would be really good to have a few people testing this out. Um, so we have a feedback form that we'll send around at the end of the webinar. It has a question about whether you'd like to trial the admin interface. Just leave us your email address if you would and we'll, and we'll get in touch. <coughs> So what to do next if you're wanting to customize DMP online? The first thing really to do is to figure out what you want as an organization. So to define your requirements. Do you ask researchers to create data management plans? If so, do you want to create a template? Um, or are you happy to say that any plans written for research funders suffice for the organization and, and you don't want to ask your own questions in addition? So think about what you want as an institution, what you potentially want to know about data management to help you support researchers. And then if you are going to have a template, draft that, draft the sections and the questions. Um, take a look at existing funder templates to see whether you want to ask any questions in addition to those. And then I think the most important thing about the customizations is really the guidance and examples and things that you can do to help researchers respond. So if you're able to have drop down options, for example, or if you're able to provide more tailored guidance at a lower level um, at particular schools or departments. And then currently um, people are passing the details on to DCC and we're loading it up in the tool. But once that admin interface is launched, we'll be able to give you access so that you can be your own organizational admin and you can enter that yourself. And then you can manage it. You can make changes as you see data management plans being created and you think, you know, maybe one particular question isn't working. You can tweak things very easily. So to find out more, um, I mentioned we have a screencast that shows how to use DMP online. We also have a blog post on how to customize the tool specifically and that walks you through the different options available and it has a spreadsheet that you can fill in to provide your template. Um, but you can provide that to us in any format. If you already have um, like a, a PDF with a, a draft template, we can work from that too. There's also the link to the tool. By all means, go and have a play around with the tool um, and let us know what you think. So that's all I wanted to say on customizing the tool. We have about half an hour left um, and I'm conscious that you may well have questions about how to go about customizing the tool or the options that are available. So, so please ask any questions and I think Joy and, and Lorna will pass those on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was great. Um, we do have quite a few questions that have come in. Okay. Um, the first one is, if people register but not using their Shibboleth login, could they still see their university guidance? Yes, yeah. Um, you'll always see the university guidance either because it picks up your organization and, and pre-populates that box um, or researchers can select an organization to see guidance from. Um, they don't need to be logged in via Shibboleth for that. Um, they, it'll either just be set on their login, they'll either have picked an organization there or they'll pick one when they're creating the plan and that'll pull in the relevant university guidance. That's great. Perfect. Um, the next question that we've got, are there any organizations using multiple customizations? Um, 
so levels of, of guidance and support. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's tends to be like one main customization but you can have different levels of guidance so you could have guidance at an institutional level and at a lower level by by department or by discipline um, what we're wanting to do when we release the admin interface is kind of agree with you who you want as your main organizational admin we can have other roles um, but if you have one person coordinating that or, or a group coordinating that that would that would be best really and then you kind of have control on how to do your customization okay that's great um, the third question we've received is will this tool uh, be shared with the DMP tool upgrade that uh, is taking place with CDL yeah so if, if people aren't aware there's a parallel tool in the states called DMP tool um, and they're currently releasing a new version they, they've had a grant from the the Sloan Foundation for that um, we we have an ongoing collaboration with them um, so we're aware of each other's work the tools currently don't integrate with they aren't um, we aren't working in parallel on them we're not kind of sharing the code base um, but all the code is on github and I think the kind of the route we're taking is kind of converging so potentially there is option for integration more in the future thanks very much that's great um, I'll move on to some of the other questions we've got quite a few coming in and I'll just kind of mention if we do run out of time for the questions we're, we're keeping track and we'll send uh, any responses if, if we do run out of time to the individuals who raise them and keep a note of them and, and send out a summary. Uh, so the next question that we have here is is the exported PDF customizable? Can you add headers, footers, uh, change the fonts and the like in as you were able to do in DMP on, on line 3? Yes, that's something that um, I will literally just show you what you get at the moment with the PDF. Um, it's, it's not currently, but that is something that we are adding. So let me go to this one that's got the worked example. Um, currently, there's just this option about adding admin or not, um, but we're conscious that you need to meet the funder requirements and they have um, expectations on the font size. Um, so that is something that we'll, we will be adding in there. So here you can see it's picking up. Um, it's just putting it in a plain plain font. It doesn't have um, logos at the top because we're trying to cut down on, on how much information, how much space is used up. Um, but it's at the moment, it's very plain. We will be adding options to pick the font, pick the size, um, so that you can make sure it meets exactly what your funder asks for. Great, that's perfect. Uh, the next question, uh, we've got quite a few still coming through. Um, can those we collaborate with who do not have a .ac.uk address, for example, an NHS address, use this tool collaboratively, or is it restricted to .ac.uk and .edu? Uh, no, it's it's open to anybody. Um, you can log up, log on with your Gmail account. It doesn't doesn't have any restrictions like that so so yes you could definitely share it with NHS addresses or, or or kind of personal addresses as well it doesn't need to be within universities okay that's great uh, the next question that we have here uh, Sarah mentioned some new export formats uh, will some of these export f formats be structured so would it be possible to export into XML XLS or CSV Yes, yeah, so CSV is already on the list and we've been looking at XML as well so that we have a structured format because um, I think that will also help with kind of um, pushing data in, in and out when we're doing the API work. Okay, great. Um, the other question I have is slightly related to the one about the .ac.uk question, um, but it is can only universities create custom templates? Um, no, actually, I, I'll show you an example. We were contacted um, by an organization within New Zealand um, that wanted to do a data management plan. Uh, let me just type in land care here. They're just a research organization. They're, they're not a, a university. Um, we've just added them to the list of organizations here. This isn't 
this isn't designed to be restricted to higher education it can be used by anyone so we've added a, a template there for land care um, which I think they're a government agency I can't remember exactly what type of organization they are um, and when you go through they they just have the template that's relevant to their researchers so information about it and the nature of the data it's the same kind of themes that they're covering um, but yeah you any or any type of organization can use DMP online okay that's great uh, swiftly on to the next question, uh, will the SWORD deposit work for the DCC hosted instance or will we have to ho self host DMP online to make use of it? Um, I don't deal with the technical side so I can't say 100% but I'm pretty sure it will work with the hosted instance. Um, I don't think the intention is that it would be something that people would have to self host. It's It was done on a local version because they've been customizing the tool at Oxford um, but they've shared the code and I think we're planning to build it into the main live instance so um, I expect that will be a feature that everybody will have access to. Okay great. Um, the next question we have here is how do we find out how many of our researchers are signed up to DMP online? Um, what you can do when you have access to the um, admin interface um, admin area there you're able to just go to this users tab and see the users within your organization um, I'll just it's still I don't want to touch anything because this is still being built so I don't know exactly what's working or what's not I haven't been into the admin area um, but it just lists the, the users within your organization their, their name and email okay great um, the next question we have here is how do we get institutional access? Um, and I, I'm wondering I what's meant exactly funny. by that question. So, so, so anyone can access a tool. When you go to, I'll just log out and go to the home page. Um, anyone can log in. Um, I think maybe you're meaning um, how do you become the administrator for your institution? Um, um, I think what we will do um, if you're wanting what, what's happened so far if people have been wanting to customize DMP online they've just dropped us an email and then we've worked with them so it will be the same process if, if people want to customize at all we can speak to you and set you as the institutional coordinator so okay. that you would have the access to the admin interface okay that's, that leads us on nicely to our next question uh, we've had a couple of people asking about when the admin interface is going to be launched um, it's a shame Marta's not on this call because she's the one working on it um, but I think within the next week or two what I've put on the feedback form is um, for testing towards the end of this month early April um, but I think it, it should be soon I've there's I've been working on the kind of the raw admin interface rather than the, the one that's been designed like this so I, I haven't been looking at it to know how far through it is um, but I think within the next couple of weeks it should be ready. That's good. I mean maybe what we can do is if you're interested in, in getting some access to this we'll um, keep in touch with you after the event and you can um, find out when it's ready to go. Um, the next question we have here is if we start to create our own templates can we hide these from public view until they're ready? Um, yeah, well, yes, kind of. We, we don't have a... On the admin side, once that's launched, you can do, because you can kind of preview it, and it's only visible to the admin user, so you can see how it will look before you push it live. Um, but at the moment, um, what we've just been doing is putting that it's a draft one if you want it in the live side, because sometimes people want, want it live so they can test it. We do have a test site too that we've, we've put a couple on, but the test site um, is, is where bugs are fixed and so on, so it's, it's a lot less stable. So if you're wanting to make your template, if you're wanting to try it out rather than just to view it and see it, um, it's kind of best in the live side really for the moment. But but once the admin interface is up, you will be able to view that without it being visible to every user. Okay, great. Um, the next question I think is about how to, to come up with customizations. So if you wanted to do something for your institution and have it really stick, who should be involved in customizing the templates? Well, what we've been doing at Edinburgh, there's um, 
a RDM group, there's like a steering group which has representation from, um, well there's actually two steering groups and um, there's one which is IS based so um, the different services within the institution and then there's an academic led steering group. Um, in the IS group we've been designing the template so we've taken the policy, we've thought about the general coverage that, that should be in the plan um, and then we've taken that to the steering group to get the researcher perspective because I think it's very easy to ask lots of questions um, and if your requirement is, is kind of too much, if there's a lot that you're asking, it's going to be difficult for researchers to respond. So I think it's really important to get the researcher's perspective on this too, about what are useful questions to ask, because it doesn't. you want to avoid it being too much of a tick box exercise and people think, you know, I'm filling in this plan because I should, because it's in our policy and I'm being asked to, but it's not actually giving me any benefit. So I think it's quite important to draw that, draw that balance to make sure that you're not just having too big a requirement that there's actually some some usefulness for the researchers too so I think if as, as broad based a group as you can get to come up with the come up with your customization um, so try and get involvement from IT and libraries and the research office and definitely try and get researchers input um, at that first drafting stage and then when when you test it and see how people respond Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, we've got a steady stream of questions coming in. <laughs> um, if um, let's see, so does that mean anybody can see any other university's guidance? So I think if you put in a yeah. customized template, it's, it's openly accessible to anybody then. Yeah, one one of the things we had in this create a plan drop down. Um, you have the funder templates. So I'll just select select not applicable for now. There is the option to click other universities. So in that example, for example, I um, picked the University of Edinburgh and saw Edinburgh's template. The reason we did that, we didn't restrict it just to that particular institution, is in case people are working in collaborative teams and it may be one partner that's right in the data management plan, but it might actually be another partner that's leading and is storing the data. So potentially you may want to get any kind of guidance and details about services at another institution. So we allowed people to select something that isn't their own organization. Um, so yes, that is a way that you would be able to see other people's customizations. Okay, great. Um, the next question on the list. If someone doesn't register with an institutional login, yeah. would you still be able to see their use in the admin section when it comes in? Um, the DCC would be able to, but the organizational admins wouldn't. So I mentioned before there's there's this kind of super admin area, which is the kind of not very nice back end, um, which is the DCC version. So we can see all, all the users, um, but on this admin in area that we will share with organizational admins, so whoever is your person at your institution, you would just see your own users, so people signed up to your organization, um, and you will only be able to edit your own templates or add questions to fund the templates. You won't have the ability to change um, another university's template, for example. Okay, great. Um, the next question then. Um, can you append any additional documents so that they can also be exported in the PDF? Um, that isn't something we thought of, no. Um, so, no. <laughs> but, it's, but it is something we could look to add in if there's, if there's a need for that. Um, I, I guess, yeah, just allowing people to upload, upload a document. I mean, the one thing to be careful of there is the page limits, um, because even just answering the question sometimes, the page limits are usually between one and four pages for the different funders. Um, so if people were adding documents to that, if they were applying for funders, there's a risk they would go over. Um, but if it's for an institutional thing, if you want to know, you know, like a department's policy, that could be a useful feature to ask them to upload their, their group policy or their storage procedures, for example. Okay. 
Uh, great. The next question we've received is, will we be looking to allow export as Serif XML? Um, that isn't one that's in, in the list of things to work on at the moment, but it is something we can add in there. Um, I should actually just show you, um, if you go to GitHub, um, I'll just search DMP online, see if that comes up. So there's a GitHub page for DMP online, um, and you will be able to see the, um, oh, that's the old version, version 4, here we go. You'll be able to see the latest code here. You can see the, the issues, the items that we're going to be working on. And if there are particular things you would like to request, like um, having Serif as an export format, by all means just add it there. Or you can email us at dmponline um, at dcc.ac.uk and we can add the request in. But no, I don't think Sarif is in the list at the moment. I'll make a note of that. I, I, we are working with um, the Kazra UK group to come up with a data management profile, which in theory should be compatible with, with Sarif. So that might be something we can start with. Um, so we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, the next question we've had. Um, a couple again about the interface being ready, so plenty of volunteers <laughs> seem to be wanting to help out. Um, the next one is a practical question about how long a customization takes in actual uh, real terms to from start to finish. Um, in terms of the intellectual work, um, I mean, we've not been doing all of that side of it, so it's hard to say exactly. But in terms of what we've done at Edinburgh, we, we've had a, a couple of meetings to discuss as a group what, what should be in the plan and, and to kind of reflect on the policy and decide what it is that Edinburgh as an institution needs to know. So I think in terms of the intellectual work, it can be a longer process to define exactly what it is that you want to know. Um, in terms of inputting it into the tool, it's quite a quick process. Um, depending on how many sections there are within your plan and how many additional things you have, like drop-down options or examples, it's kind. Of, it's normally like a few hours up, up to a day maximum for one that's like really detailed. Um, so the actual inputting it is, is quite quick and easy, but there's a fair amount of, of thought to go into the process of, of what wants to be in your template. I think that's that kind of intellectual process is, is the longest bit, really. And particularly thinking of examples, because it's very easy to ask questions and to think about what you want to ask, but it's, it's really much more important and much more useful for the end user if you can provide suggestions and examples. And I think adding all that kind of rich help is the most important bit. So that it could be quite a, quite a long process collecting all of that together. But again, that's something that you could do in stages. You could have a first draft up and have that worked on and have people try it and over time add more guidance and help. Yeah, that's great. And I think that comes back to the previous question about how do you really um, pr produce a successful template. And I, I think it really does depend on making sure that you're talking to the right people and, and getting that sort of local, um, e really helpful information in rather than just overloading people with too many um, various options. Uh, I'm conscious of the time kind of ticking forward. We've got a few other questions that are coming in. Um, the next one here is, quite a tricky one. It is, how sustainable is DMP online, and what are the DCC commitments to supporting free access to it over time? Um, in terms of how sustainable, um, we have all the code available on GitHub, so that's open so that others can pick it up and reuse it. Um, and we would actually encourage that. We would like to make this more of a community resource, not something that, that just DCC is doing. We're, we're very open to people's suggestions to enhance this and, and shape the future direction of the tool. Um, one of the probably the biggest risks we have at the moment is that we only have two developers working on DMP online and they're both also on other things. So in terms of the development resource, um, I think we do need to try and get a bit more effort behind that so we're able to respond more quickly and push new new requests through um, a bit quicker. But the DCC is committed to this. It's a tool we've been developing since um, 
2010, I think the first version was launched in. There's a lot of interest in it. It's become something that universities are picking up and, and internationally it's got recognition and interest. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no plans to charge for it. Um, if people want something that requires a lot of a lot of resource and it's for just a particular institution it's not going to be of benefit to others then we may well have to say you know if we do that we'll have to charge you the development time because it's not something that you know it's something that's just about your branding or it's something that is really only useful to your university um, but in terms of the resource you know this is free for researchers to use and there's no intention to, to start charging for it. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. And again, just to, to remind everybody that it is openly available. The code is in GitHub. So, you know, should something catastrophic happen to us, hopefully it, it <laughs> will still be there and, and people can um, still make use of it and, and start to take it forward. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Um, hopefully we can get them all through in the next five or six minutes. Um, the next one is, can the DCC provide any feedback so far on customizations that people have undertaken? And I, I think this kind of goes back to how long does it take and who should be involved. So do we have any feedback that we can share with um, potential users? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to know the uptake of the different customizations, so how researchers have been responding to them, um, because we tend to we get past the information and we, and we enter it and then we kind of pass it back to the organization to, to manage and do any local training or, or events um, one of the reflections I have just on entering these different customizations is really on on the guidance and the support so I showed you I didn't actually go into it but I showed you that there was one from Landcare in New Zealand and what I really liked about that one was that it's got a work example the whole way through it so every single question has an example answer next to it and I think that's really useful because people don't don't always have a sense of of how much information to give as a response or or what they should put I think having an example helps to contextualize the question and helps people just click their mind into what's actually being asked um, so there's there's a lot actually that I've entered which are more question focused and, and there's less of an emphasis on the guidance and and personally I, I think the more you can shift it to the other end and, and put as much help as possible the better. Um, quite a lot of universities have developed their templates and then run training courses or, or done some kind of testing and I think that's a useful process so that you're getting the feedback on your template and, and getting a sense of what researchers are looking for from you. So I would encourage that as much as possible as well. And if there's particular feedback from those testing and training events about the tool specifically, please do let us know because we, we are open to changes and, and, to ch and to improving the tool however you need. Thanks very much. Um, a couple of last questions that have come in. Um, as I said before, anything that we can't get uh, squeezed into the session, we'll, we'll respond to offline and summarize for everybody um, after the event. Um, the question is, will we be able to transfer plans from DMP Online version 3, or is this not going to be possible? Um, what we can do is um, pull a plan through as, as a kind of, you're able to view it, you're able to export it. One of the things that's difficult to do is to um, be able to edit it because the, the data model is quite different. Um, for people who aren't as familiar with DMP Online version 3, that used the DCC checklist throughout, so the questions that were being asked came from the DCC rather than from the funders or the universities. Um, so it's hard to match it directly to be able to kind of map it to what you have in the tool now and and um, fit it into that same framework. But if people have plans that they don't want to lose, we can pull them through so they can access them within the system. Um, but there's just a question about how how much we can um, allow the kind of editing, but that's something we can look at to, to try and make it as useful as possible. So if there are plans that you have or users that you know have a lot in the tool, um, just put us in touch and, and we'll work with them to pull things through. Okay, that's great. And I think we've got just one last question. Um, is there an easy way to do version control in the customized data management plan? 
Um, versioning is built in, so um, when you go to add a new template, you set the current version, um, and then when you make updates, it goes to like the, the next version. Um, so that's already built in, so that we can manage the the versions of your template and and see that change over time. Because you'll find that with the funder templates as well, they do release new versions every couple of years. There will be changes to those templates. And you want to make sure researchers are getting the right version, <laughs> not something that was the kind of 2009 requirements. OK, well, that's great. I think we are just about out of time. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you very much to Sarah for giving us such a, a useful and um, concise walkthrough of DMP Online version 4 and showing us how to customize the tool to make our own lives a little bit easier when we go back to our institutions. Um, for those of you who have expressed an interest in, in helping us to test the admin interface and who want access, um, we'll be in touch and, and we'd be delighted to get your feedback and, and your involvement. Um, we will try to summarize the, the responses to the questions and we'll send them out to you as well. Um, the slides and the recording will be sent out to you after the session so you'll have access to these to go back. If you missed anything you can go back and, and uh, view it at your leisure. Um, and we are also, because this is, the, this is the first of our webinars and we're always kind of uh, hoping that they're quite useful and that the technology has worked quite well. So we'd be really grateful for any feedback that you have. And I think we can point you towards a, a feedback page and we'd be really grateful if you could um, just take five minutes and, and fill that out. And I'd just like to thank everybody for coming along and wish you the best of luck in uh, customizing DMP in your own institutions. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're just going to redirect you to the feedback page now so it will take you out of the system. Please um, let us know what you thought. Goodbye.